Sundays, the Gospel reading was from John's Gospel. And if you were here last Sunday for Annual Meeting Sunday, you'll remember that this story we heard today is very similar to the one that was heard last Sunday. Jesus meeting his first disciples and telling them, follow me. So this version from Matthew's Gospel is sort of take two of the same story. We get to hear, again, from a different angle, what it looked like for Jesus to invite his first followers. And as I've been thinking this week about the whole mystery of following Jesus, four questions have come to my mind. And it's these four. If I follow Jesus, what will I give up? If I follow Jesus, what will I take on? If I follow Jesus, how will I let go? And if I follow Jesus, who will I lift up? First hymn we sang this morning has a little bit of that old time religion to it, giving up unrespectable, slightly naughty things in order to be a good, respectable Christian. And it's a great hymn, but it reminds me of an experience I had many, many years ago when I used to work in the Loop, and there on the corner of State and Washington, I don't know if this guy is still there, this old African-American street preacher, and he was there on the corner with his megaphone and his uh, placards. Is he still there? Still there. Good, great. Okay, so the guy is still there. <laughs> really? But no, I mean, there is that sense of if you are going to follow Jesus, you're going to have to give up all those fun things and all those naughty things so that you can be a respectable follower of Jesus. But really, throughout all of history, the very first way that people have <coughs> struggled with what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is what you have to give up. And of course, if you think throughout the history of the church, people kind of knew what they were talking about. Because they knew what Jesus was talking about when they followed him. They would give up, to different extents, money, power, privilege, sex, you name it. It would all, in some way or another, be given up by different people who say, I've got to follow Jesus, and therefore I've got to leave behind all sorts of things. And then, of course, there's the question of what will I take? If they take on the Christian life, if they take on following Jesus, for a lot of people, it looks like they're supposed to take on churchy things. So they're supposed to do church and become a member of that church where you get to be respectable because you've given so, so many things. But I'm not so sure about that dynamic, even though it's the one most people kind of expect. When they follow Jesus, what will they give up and what will they take on? Here is really what I think. We give up. It's certainty. We give up certainty when we follow Jesus. And we take on trust. When Jesus met his disciples to be there on the Sea of Galilee's shores, working with their nets and in their boats and hauling in the catch. I have no idea what made them follow him. Was it something about his magnetic personality? Was it maybe his sense of good humor? Who knows? Was it just that beckoning sense, oh, come on, I'll show you something really wonderful? What did they do? They dropped everything. No, it was something deeper probably than even that. But we cannot be sure. But whatever it was that attracted these folks to follow this stranger 
must have been reshaping their souls even as it happened. Well, it's one thing to be attracted to a teacher and a healer and a proclaimer of good news. And it's yet another thing to stick with him. Because for us who know how this story goes, we can look right there at this little episode and say, oh, if you only knew Andrew and Peter, if you only knew James and John what you are in for, if you only knew what lies ahead. Because in the midst of the celebrity tour that Jesus makes in the Galilean countryside and his relatively short ministry, they will not only get to see the healing and speak with him as a teacher and understand that he is there to cast out evil out of people's lives and bring healing and wholeness. They will love all of that. But at some point, church, you know, he is going to set his face toward Jerusalem. And he is going to move like a moth toward a flame, toward the trajectory of the cross. And it's going to be really hard for his friends to stick with him. They are not going to want to. And in fact, in the Gospels, we see over and over again, once Jesus has given his friends a clue that he's going to be betrayed, that he's going to suffer, that he's going to die, they panic, they act out, they think of all the different ways that they can hold on to all the fun and wonderful and whole aspects of Jesus and their relationship with him, but they do not want what is coming. They want, they want certainty that this will all be good. Well, that's not what Jesus is getting. And so, for any human being who is called by Jesus to follow, that's the thing you give up. Above and beyond all the things you think you're giving up, the car playing and the clean living and all that, that doesn't matter in the end. You think you're doing a big favor to God by giving up lots of things, but really, we are giving up certainty. Well, what does it mean then to take on trust? I couldn't imagine, I'd like to imagine, but I have a hard time imagining. Taking on the kind of trust that Jesus calls forth from his friends as he heads toward the cross. No doubt some of them, perhaps those who never made it into the gospel page, dropped it and walked away. No doubt there were those who were shaken by their lack of trust. We can think of Peter the Apostle and James and John who could barely stay awake in that garden of Gethsemane the night before he died. We can think of all those people who broke trust with Jesus, and yet he trusted them, especially when he appeared to them in his risen glory. It's wonderful to think that in the Acts of the Apostles, you know, there are these little mini sermons that show up in Acts of the Apostles as the different saints of God spread the word. And as they do so, very often, they say, and to all of this that we share with you, we are witnesses. A couple weeks ago, we read the story about Peter meeting the centurion, Cornelius, and Peter described the whole experience of what it meant to follow Jesus who was filled with the Holy Spirit and with great power. And in the end, Peter says to all of these things, even to his death and to his resurrection, we are witnesses. And you know, you don't get to be a witness if you don't have the trust to stick around. So the trust that we have with Jesus is the kind that just hangs in there. It endures. So when we say we are giving up certainty, we are taking on trust, we are in it for the long haul with him who says,
says follow. Well, how will I let go? I can ask myself. How will I let go? This is even beyond saying what will I give up. How will I let go? There is something about the Christian journey that involves a profound letting go. For some people, it's a conversion experience. For others, it is a cyclical experience of the Spirit from one season of life to the next. How will I let go if I'm a follower of Jesus? You know, C.S. Lewis talks about the whole desire to be a good person in his book, Mere Christianity. And he says that you kind of start by putting on Christ. You know, the contemporary version is, what would Jesus do? You know, you sort of put on the imagination of Christ. And you do your best to just be that kind of a person that is worthy of the name of Jesus. You try. And Lewis, at some point, says, you know, you just have to keep trying and trying and trying. And yes, you pick yourself up and you say to God, I'm sorry when you fail and you move on. But at some point, it's got to hit you that you cannot do that forever. You are not giving God credit where credit is due. For if you have put on Christ, you are a new creation. And it's nothing that you and I can do on our own. It is nothing that you and I can conjure up on our own. And so to say that we are letting go is almost a point of spiritual, egotistical breakdown. To allow God to pick up where you think you've left off. Well, how? How do I let go? I'm going to tell you, without going into too much detail, <laughs> Where I think it starts. Let it go. How does it start? I can't tell you how it ends, but I can, I can imagine the way that it starts. This may sound weird for a minute. Let it go, as a disciple of Jesus, begins, I believe, with self-compassion. Compassion for who you are. I want you to imagine, if you can, um, sort of reality TV version of you meeting Jesus. Okay. So you're outside the picture, but you know that's you with him. And if you are a disciple who is following Jesus, then yes, you are interested in what he has to say. You have taken to heart, perhaps, his message of repent, because the kingdom of heaven is really close. And you have tried to put on the kind of spirit and the kind of sense, the kind of wonder and mystery that he invites you into. But if you stand back just a little bit, you can say, you know, inside this person who I'm seeing there in front of Jesus, inside this person is a person who self-sabotages everything that can be beautiful. Everything that this beautiful man offers to me, I somehow find a way of ruining it or messing it up or ignoring it when times are good for me. I have a way of really trying to bend the goodness and the beauty that he offers to my own way for my own convenience. Or maybe I just have these profound moments of not even giving a damn. Not even caring what he offers, except when I'm really hurting. Picture that, you and Jesus. You have this view into this person who is you. And in some times in my life, when I have tried to be everything I can be on my own terms, I have stepped back and I said, my God, that is one sad person. That is one sad human being. Here in front of the goodness of God trying to put on airs of how complete and perfect I am. How, what, how well I have it together and how little I really need. 
imperfect you are, who desires to follow. That's how I have experienced letting go. Not just feeling sorry for myself, it's not even close to that. But allowing myself to truly feel the suffering of being under the illusion of perfection and self-sufficiency. I need God. We all need God. We need the news of the kingdom of God. We need to know it's here. Oh boy, do we need to know the cost, the feeling of what we call repentance. Turning around, dropping what doesn't matter, letting it go, giving it up, taking something on that is a lie, that is deathless in Jesus. So if I am following Jesus, if you and I are following him as the church, we give up certainty. We take on trust because that's the only thing that will help us stick with him. And we can let go by seeing for just a moment of grace how deeply we need him. What I would imagine is a self and I almost want to say that the final thing, who will I lift up, is a question that answers itself. Jesus is the one that we lift up, crucified and risen. And somehow that this call to be one who lifts up Jesus is not just done in action or in word, it is done with all of those things, with all of our strength and soul and mind. It is done in that complete job description of every Christian in the baptismal covenant. That's how it's lived out. There's not a moment, not an occasion, not an instance, not a relationship, not a season of life when Jesus cannot be lifted up in your life and mine. And he offers us these resources of his love in place of certainty in life and trust in him instead of confidence in ourselves, we can turn to him, we can trust him, we can let go because it is safe to do so with him. Imagine the kingdom of God filled with people like that, like you and me, lifting him up. Amen. Amen. Amen.